So good morning. So today's sermon's gonna be a bit different. I'm specifically talking to church people. That if those of you who follow Jesus, especially for those of you who call First Baptist Church your home church, if you're new, you just get a behind the scenes and insider conversations and what to expect if you decide to make this your church or follow Jesus. You see, over the past couple of months, we've experienced a lot of different things. We've seen a lot of people take their next step of faith in baptism. We've seen a lot of different people commit to being members of our church. And that is when you become a member, you're partnering with us to help more people find and follow Jesus. We've had that going along with Easter Jam, Easter services, our marriage ministry re-engage is going full swing on Wednesday nights. I mean, there are so many great things happening. And I've heard so many people comment about, man, it's just this level of excitement. There's just so many nifty things going on and people just, just, just happy about all that's going on. But this is what churches are supposed to do. This is what church should feel like all the time when, the, when we gather because people's lives are being changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, healthy growing churches are constantly seeing people step up, step out, find Jesus, follow Jesus, and, and all that involves. That's just what they do. I mean, churches that are healthy and growing are constantly changing and adapting because new people automatically bring new change because there's new people, there's different things, there's other opportunities. There's a newness because new people are coming. And so if we're going to welcome new people, if we're going to have others join us, then things have to change because there's a change of people. But this is what churches are supposed to do. You see, from the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus to the very beginning of the church to 2,000 years later, we see the church on mission to reach more people with the gospel. That is to help them find Jesus, help them follow Jesus. That's what the church does. That's why we exist. And we know it's printed in the bulletin. You'll keep here saying it, but we exist to help people find and follow Jesus. That's what the church is for. This is what we do. This is how we, in fact, bring glory to God. And in order for us to continue to do these things, which we, we're going to continue to do them, but in order for that to happen, we need more people. We need you to step up and commit to the ministries of the church. And so today, my ask is for each one of you to personally get involved in ministry towards other people because people are the point. So I'm asking every single person to get involved in a ministry that's directly related to connecting with other people. I mean, over the past couple of weeks, we've seen the incredible power of Jesus. And over, it's not only through our study as we're walking through the gospel of Matthew, but we've seen it in our church as well. We've seen this miraculous stuff happening over and over again. And we want to continually see that happening. You see, Matthew's about to pivot in his gospel, in his story, where we're about to see another teaching session from Jesus. We've already seen this happen once. In Matthew chapter four, he pivots. And before he does, he gives a summary statement of what Jesus is doing and, and what it looks like. And then he launches in Matthew five through seven, what's called the Sermon on the Mount. We took our time walking through that. Well, he's about to pivot again. He's about to go through another discourse section. We're gonna start on next week about Jesus teaching his followers what it looks like to be sent out for him. But before he does that, he explains once again in this summary statement, all that is happening. You see, as Jesus moves, things start to multiply. As Jesus moves, more people's lives are being changed. And as more people's lives are being changed, more people are telling people about Jesus. And so we see these crowds constantly pressing in and now Jesus looks out and now all of a sudden we need more people stepping up, getting involved. Let's jump in. I'll show you Matthew 9 verse 35. It says, Jesus traveled through the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news, announcing or preaching the good news about the kingdom of God, the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. 
So notice when it comes to Jesus, he was actively involved in reaching out to other people. He didn't just set up shop in the temples and wait for everybody to come him. He traveled around to the different synagogues. He was this traveling preacher going out intentionally, reaching people, telling more people about him. And his ministry is described in three ways. And we see this first, it's teaching. So Jesus shows concern about understanding for people to grasp what he's doing and and his message, what it looks like to live a life for him versus what it looks like to live a life that the world has to offer. And then he went around preaching, announcing preaching. That's the same word. And this just shows his concern for commitment that when he preached about the kingdom of God, when he preached about what he was doing, he called for you and for me and for them to make a decision Like this is a decision time. Like if you want to be about what God is doing, he went around saying, repent and believe. But he also went around healing people. He was meeting needs. He was showing his concern for the wholeness of a person. And the miraculous things he was doing was pointing to the miraculous things that he was doing inside their lives, the spiritual things. And it's verifying that he really is this Messiah, this long awaited one foretold well before his time that he were to come. And so Jesus went around and the the crowds were gathered and look at what he does in verse 36. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had, say this word with me, compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so when Jesus saw this, I mean, think about this. When Jesus saw the last, the least and the lost, When Jesus saw the messed up people engulfed in sin, when he saw the worst of these, not just the least of these, when he saw the worst of these, he had what? Well, does that describe the church? It should. He had compassion on them. And this word compassion is a strong emotional feeling. It's an inner feeling. It's literally, he felt it within his bowels, right? I don't know if you want to say that to your neighbor this week, but he felt it deep inward, like this concern for other people. Basically his whole heart went out for messed up people. And in the New Testament, this word is only used of Jesus and by Jesus. Nobody else is described in this way to have this compassion it, this feeling towards people. You see, Jesus felt compassion rather than judgment. And for the life of me, I have no idea why the church gets this wrong. For far too long, churches, and you know this, we've been known for being judgmental, being known for being hypocritical, not being compassionate and loving and caring, but that is in fact what Jesus was. Who did he give a hard time to? Who did he claim was criticals? Critic, I meant, who did he claim were hypocrites? Yeah, the religious people who were judging everyone else. You see that? And we still do it. He had compassion because he saw their true need. His immediate response was to look past where they are and understood that the problem is They didn't have a leader. They didn't have this person to guide them, which is why he came. You see, the the picture here is that they're helpless sheep and and sheep are helpless. They can't do things on their own. And so the picture is this, this sheep that's been attacked by life, this main sheep who's hungry, who's been attacked, who can't feed itself, who's all just burly, you know, kind of how you woke up this morning, kind of looked like that, all messed up. And see, that's what it is without Jesus. He's like, man, it's not they're just sinning. It's that they don't have this leader. They don't have me. And so Jesus looked at them and said, here's their greatest need. And for us, when we see people and we see their sin and we see their life, it's not about where they are. It's where they could be in Christ. And their need is Jesus. Their need isn't another 12-step program. Their need isn't, you know, this latest and greatest new modern theory. Their need is Jesus because the biblical basis is that we're all sinners And our first and primary need is his forgiveness and that connection with him. And so Jesus knew this. And so he saw people differently. And my prayer is that we can see people differently. We can have compassion for people. 
And Jesus put their needs above his own. And if we wanna be like Jesus, and if we wanna see people's lives changed, and we have to have this emotional response when we see other people, not be judgmental, not talk about what they're wearing, or I don't know, you pick it. We don't talk about that stuff anymore. I don't even remember the examples. We're so past that now. But rather than just beating people up for where they're not at, do we see them as helpless, man? Like, man, they need Jesus. Let me be this person to let them know. Let me be this person to walk life with them. We see this movement of God, the kingdom was breaking in the world and the needs were far, than, far greater than just Jesus could do on his own. And so he said to his disciples in verse 37, he said to his disciple, the harvest is great. Say the next part with me. But the workers are few. The harvest is great. Everything's ready. There's an abundance. The apples are ready to be picked. The ban I don't, bananas grow on trees? I don't even know. I haven't seen. Bananas are, are, are I, I got apples. That's as far as my metaphor goes. I should have wrote some down or my examples go. He says, it's ready to be picked. The corn's ready to go. Like it's ready, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his field. And you see, folks, this is still true today. The harvest is plentiful. There are still people ready to experience what Jesus has to give. There are plenty of people who need to be shown how to follow Jesus. You see, the gospel doesn't have a problem. There's nothing wrong with the message of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. It's the same message that can still transform lives that's been around for thousands of years. The gospel still changes lives and we've witnessed this. Churches all over the world still witness this. People are ready to respond in faith. The problem isn't the gospel. The problem is the workers are few. And too many people, and perhaps you, sit back and watch everybody else do the work. And you're missing out on the greatest opportunity that has be, been presented to you in this world. That is to find your purpose and God's plan for your life. And I already know what it is. You're like, Brian, you don't know. I do know. It's the same for all of us. To make disciples that is helping people find and follow Jesus. You, if you aren't doing those things, don't ask him for the other things because if you can't do what he's already asked you to do, why is he gonna give you more to do? If you have kids, you know this. If you can't do what I've already asked, I'm surely not gonna give you more. Just take the trash out. How is it, why is it so hard? Do y'all know why it's so hard? I don't know why it's so hard. Do what you've already been asked to do and then he will re reveal more. And our prayers of staff this week has been for God to send more workers in the field. And so if you do that typical Baptist response, Brian, I need to pray about it. No, you don't. I've been praying for you <laughs> all week. Already been praying for you. You're like, I'm not too sure. I already am sure. I already know. The problem isn't the gospel. The problem in our country is not the gospel. The problem in our country is not the politics. It's not this current generation. The problem isn't any of those things. The problem is the workers are few. We're too busy. We're doing everything else. And I can tell you for an absolute fact, I mean, I promise you, as the pastor of this church, I 100% guarantee you, guarantee you that serving others is a key way for you to grow spiritually. I see time after time, and I have these conversations behind the scenes, time after time where people are upset at churches, whether you're new to our church, you're like, hey, I'm mad at my church, I'm upset, they're not feeding me, they're not doing things I want, and we have people that have left here, hey, I'm not being fed, things aren't going the way I want, and time after time, there's a constant theme, there's a constant theme, they're not involved, they're not serving other people. I can tell you, if you are not serving others, if you are not giving your life to helping other people grow, you will, all, you will feel disconnected. 
you will feel like, man, I don't really have a place here. I don't really have a part to play. Like, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just disconnected. I, I, it's the church's fault. It is not. The workers are few. The problem isn't that you need another Bible study. The problem is you need to get involved and start serving others. And I believe and I know that that is a key part to your spiritual life, serving other people. Because people are the point. They always have been. And everything we do in ministry needs to be centered around helping other people, helping you step up and serve in ministry. You are missing out on this deeper spiritual connection to the Lord and living out your purposes and plans. Because all of us, each one of us, we need a personal ministry that is ours, that we're a part, not ours as we own, but we're saying we're a part of like, this is my ministry for the Lord. When the Lord says, hey, Brian, what are you doing? I'm like, mm, Lord, this is what I'm doing right here. I can point to it. This is how I'm serving other people. This is what I'm invested in. This is what I care about. This is what I'm praying for. I know the people's names in it. I care about those people. I know the events that we're doing. Like this is my ministry that I'm actively involved in. Not to just serve to serve, not to just check a box, but something we are investing in to help other people grow in their faith. So the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So our prayer has been, Lord, send them out. And you showed up. I'm so excited. You answered his call this morning. It continues. Here's what he does next. Matthew 10, 1. It says, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them the authority to cast out evil spirits, to heal every kind of disease and illness. And so the needs of ministry were great. So Jesus called his disciples, they were many, and he chose 12 to be these apostles. And the interesting thing is he gives them the same authority that they've been witnessing only him doing. And so Jesus calls them just like he calls you. And then he equips them. He gives them what they need to carry out their purposes and plans. And so check this out. Would they have known they had the authority to do these things if they never went and did those things? Nope. They had it. He gave it to them. But it's not until they stepped up and they stepped out that they experienced that authority. Jesus has given you everything you need. If you're a believer, you have, been, you have the, uh, the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. He's already given you a gift. It's already there, available for you to use. You just have to step up and step out to use it. And so we see these apostles and hear their names. List them out. It says, here are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also called Peter. Then Andrew, Peter's brother. James, the son of Zebedee. John, James' brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, the guy who wrote the book. James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas Iscariot, who later betrays, betrayed him. That'd just be a terrible parenthesis next to your name whenever it's written, isn't it? And here's that guy. But what's written next to your name? Just a thought. But what's amazing is that these are the men who stepped up and stepped out. They have their name written down in God's word so everyone else can see their devotion and their commitment. This was his volunteer list. These are the ones who said, Jesus, I'm on board to carry out your mission into this world. And my question is for you, is your name written down on our volunteer list? Is your name written down? Because these 11 leaders carried forward the mission of Jesus after, you know, Jesus, Judas obviously didn't, but after Jesus was beaten, crucified, buried, rose from the dead, these 11 apostles, along with Matthias and, and Paul and 120, these 120 people literally, not figuratively, literally changed the entire world. Like that's history. Even if you don't believe that Jesus is the son of God, it is history that these 120 people changed time. They changed the history and the direction of the world. If you don't believe in Jesus, good luck explaining that. But we believe in Jesus and that's what happened. And there's more than 120 of us sitting in this room right now. 
There is no reason why we could not reach this city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no reason why we couldn't transform the entire Grand Strand with the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the same spirit is still alive that was working then that rose Jesus from the grave that lives inside of us. The gospel is still as powerful, still changing lives. The difference is the workers are few. You say, Brian, times have changed. You're right. Back then, you would get hung, beaten, set on fire, or crucified for going against it. What happens now if you speak out in Jesus' name? Someone might dislike your Facebook. Ah, that's it. That's all you got. It's far worse, far worse back then. I mean, considering what the government does, we complain about, you know what? We got to call the city out. We need to cut an oak back. This is, this is ridiculous. It takes up time. Back then, they'd just kill you. You touched an oak, right? They'd kill you. I mean, it's so different. The gospel is still powerful. People's lives and people are still wanting to know Jesus. There's nothing wrong with the gospel. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so we have been praying all week, as I told you, that Lord, we pray for the workers this week. And we need your help. And I've heard so many times, I said, Brian, listen, but what about me? And I love it. What about you? Let's talk about you. As Christians, we have to grasp that when we stop thinking about ourselves, God starts to do an amazing work in our lives. When we stop thinking about us, God will start showing up. As I told you earlier, serving others is a key way. Investing in others is a key way for God to grow your faith. And when you stop thinking about you and you start having compassion for others and your heart starts breaking for others, when you move towards getting involved, God will show up in incredible ways. Because listen, when you move towards others, God will start moving towards you. But some of us, all we do is think about us and God's like, well, what do I, you got you covered. Start thinking about others and he'll show up and take care of you. So, well, Brian, okay, I want to get involved. I just don't know how. I'm so glad me and you're on the same page because we're now going to talk away, spend the rest of our time together talking about ways you can get involved in ministries. First up, Next Generation Ministries. If you want to open up your pamphlet that you should have gotten when you came in. Oh, yes, it's school time. It is school time. We're going to walk through the Next Generation Ministries. Our church is fully devoted to investing in the next generation. And we believe it's our duty for all of us to pour out to and serve the next generation of Jesus followers. And listen, parents, if you're a parent, you need to hear this very clearly. If your child is involved in our next generation ministries, we expect you to be involved as well. You said, Brian, did you say expect? I absolutely said expect. If your kid is involved in Next Generation Ministries, we expect you to be involved. And if you've ever had a kid or been a kid, we would love for you to be involved. Which is how many of us? All of us, I know. Don't you like how that works? But listen, all of us need to be involved. If you have a kid in there, so expect a follow-up call, expect an email, like listen, Your kid's in here, we need you in here. And some of you, we may not want you in there, but we'll have those private conversations on a different day. But first up, we have, here's how you can get involved. We got preschool opportunities. So preschool, here's what we got listed out. We got the Sunday school hour, Sunday school hour, okay? And here's what we need. Preschool check-in, Sunday school volunteer. This is where you're loving and caring on the kids. Baby room, if you love to hold babies, I am not one of those people. I like them for about three minutes. Then I want to give them back, okay? But if you want to hold babies, we need you. And then we have the toddler room. We're praying for you, those of you who volunteer in the toddler room. And then their kindergarten room. And then preschool prep. And this is a different thing that we really want to get going. And basically, if you have some time during the week, I would say retired, but I found retired people work just as much as everybody else. So basically, this is if you have some time during the week and you could come during office hours, we want to start making sure that everything is prepared for our preschool and children's workers. It already is now, but we want to expand this. And so if you have time during the office hours, you can come in, you can cut some crafts out or 
I don't know. Should have gave more examples. That's all I got. Cut crafts out. That's what you can do. Organize things. Make things nice. In order to facilitate for the volunteers who are showing up that Sunday so everything's put together, everything's nice. You're not having to figure out how to do it at home. We have done it for you here. So we have this for the Sunday school time, but now we have the church opportunities. And the church opportunities is during this 10 o'clock hour, right? So we need church volunteers that you can love on and care for those kids during this time. And of course, the baby room volunteers volunteers, the toddler room volunteers, and the kinder room volunteers. That's kindergarten area. Same time, we have these guys separated because there's different needs and different wants. And so if you're like, hey, I could serve on this. Their commitments are about once a month or once every other month, once every six weeks. I don't know, the more of you who signed up, the bigger rotation would be. Math is pretty great sometimes. And in this instance, it's pretty great. The more people that step up to serve, the less you will actually serve. So we need all of that and more just for the preschool, which is the guys downstairs. Next up, we have children. We need the same thing about children. We need small group leaders. What we really, um, and, and this is a big, big, massive need. We already kind of have our preschoolers set up, but we need to start breaking out our children's. We have fifth graders and first graders all in the same area, and we recognize we need to start separating them. There's too many kids, and their needs are different. But the only way we can start breaking them up based on age is if we have more what? Workers, correct, we need more workers. You say, well, Brian, what happened? What happened was COVID, y'all remember that time? And then during COVID, we had like three, four kids and all of a sudden it's significantly larger. So we need to start breaking them up. So we need more children's, this is for Sunday school and for church opportunity. We're gonna need bigger crowds in there to start helping up. We also need Sunday school leaders, Sunday school volunteers and children's prep, same thing, that's during the week. Same thing for children's church, children's leader, volunteer leader. We need some of you like, hey, I can teach, I got this, I'm the best teacher in the world. And we're like, let's go. And some of you are like, I do not want to teach, but I can yell at kids. You're great too. We can use you. No problem. You can, we need our kids yelled at. My kids are up there. I'm well aware of it. It's okay. You can yell at my kids. I'm not, I'm not upset about it. All right. So we need children's workers. And we also need student leaders. Okay. Student leaders, small group leaders, Sunday school teachers, and game leaders. So we have the opportunities for Sunday morning. We have the um, Sunday school time for the students. But we also have on Sunday nights for the students from 4 to 5.15, we have the middle schoolers. And so we need people to show up, hang out, have some food, play some kickball, have a great time, spend some time investing in these kids. And you have the high schoolers, the same thing. Their time starts at like 5.15, 5.30, something like that, to like 7. And here's what I know. I hear all the time about how crazy our world is. Every generation is like, Brian, it has changed what these kids, and I see pictures and they show me these animal things and people talk about public schools, they talk about private schools, people talk about home schools. I mean, everybody talks about how terrible the world is now. And I'm like, I got it. Have you invested in someone who's going through it though? Like there are real kids who need real adults to help them walk through this craziness. It's one thing to talk about it, but are you investing in these kids who have to live it? That's what we need, someone to walk through and be like, yeah, I know it's hard in high school. It was hard when I was in high school. Was it hard for y'all? Imagine now. Well, middle school was really messed up. I don't remember, I blacked those years out. I, I was chubby and short, terrible time in the Hoffman's life, terrible time, middle school. But they need people who are speaking truth. They need adults who know they love. And you're like, Brian, I'm too old for that. You're not, statistically, you're not. They, they, they don't care. Maybe you can't do kickball, we got people for that. Well, we need more but you can love on them, you can build relationships with them. They can have someone who shows like, man, okay, I get this. And that's what I'm saying, we need everybody. Don't, don't complain about the state of the world if you're not willing to invest in the state of our kids. Because that's what we need, more people investing and loving in all these kids. And so if your kid is in any of these, if you're like, Brian, listen, I have preschoolers and I have babies and I really don't like my own, so I don't think I should help others. Listen, I'm a parent, I know how that feels. I'm not gonna tell you what ages I don't care for. But let's just say that's you. But you're like, Brian, but I could hang out with some high schoolers because they're cool. Okay, come hang out with some high schoolers, we're good with that. If you're like, Brian, I cannot stand high schoolers. And I have high schoolers, I don't like my kids right now. I get it. You can come hold babies. You don't have to be involved in a specific age group. We know everybody's different. Everybody uh, connects to different groups of kids and that's okay. 
but we're just asking you to be involved in some way in the next generation ministries in general. general. So we have these needs and we're gonna to continue to push these needs. And I'm gonna be extremely clear. The next generation ministries, Lindy's doing a great job. She's creating more work for all of us to do. Isn't that great when you have people like that come work with you, give you more work? I didn't know that's what I was signing up for, but that's what happened. But here's the deal. We're not starting any new ministries at this church. People ask me about them all the time until we get the ones we need filled, filled. Just like any organization knows, you're not gonna start 50 different projects if you can't do the one project. So we gotta get this filled before we start new things. I'm just throwing that out there to let everybody know. Everybody has great ideas. We wanna have a lot of ministries, but we gotta take care of the next generation. It's ridiculously important. So we have these ways to get involved with students. Next, we have the special events. A lot of you already do these, but special events are like the Mother's Sun Dance, Easter Jam, Summer Jam. You gotta love Summer Jam, right? Do you see the parentheses? The week formerly known as VBS. That is so fun, I love it. We're the Jam Church now, it's official. So Summer Jam, Trunk or Treat, Trunk Jam. I think it's gonna be called Trunk Jam by next week, don't worry, <laughs> Trunk Jam. Yeah, tr Jody, yeah, I see you. Trunk Jam needs to go right there. And then we have Jingle Jam. Yes, these are things that we ask all of you, to, and many of you already show up. You get involved, you're a part of this, and it's great. But we wanted to present this to say, hey, know these are coming up, and these are the different ways you can get involved in those things. Many of you already do, and it's great, and we thank you. But we just wanted to throw that out to remember these things, look for those coming up. We also have the security team. We need help with this. Next slide. Security team. Listen, our world's crazy. We already know that. So we need more people to serve on a rotation basis to help us make the safe environment for kids and for you. The security team, they show up a little bit earlier, they open some doors, they close some doors, and you get to wear a really cool walkie-talkie with an earpiece. I mean, I don't know, that's, that's about the coolest thing. You wanna look cool with a little earpiece in your ear, you should join the security team. And no, you don't have to be six foot 10, there's only one of us here who is, okay? You don't have to be that tall. But, Anybody can do it because a lot of it, we're not asking you to go tackle people. We're not asking you to go fight people, but we're asking you to be a presence and to watch out and pay attention to what's going on. And so even if you're not a police officer, you can join that and um, information in there who to follow up. We also have the greeter ministry, and this is very, very important. We have the greeter ministry that welcome people when they first come in, and then also after the service, post-service. And we need you to be friendly. So some of you, again, we're gonna say this isn't the team for you, but that's okay. But listen, for greeter ministry, one of our visions as a church is to create welcoming and authentic environments. And we need people who are looking for people to make sure that they're comfortable when they walk in the door. You see, we already know that the world doesn't automatically think of the church as a comfortable place. We've already done the studies, it's already out, that churches can be fearful, churches can be nervous. And I don't know about you, but I've went to a, I've went to a mosque before, right? Even as a believer, I went to a mosque when I was in, uh, overseas. And when I went in that mosque, even though it was during the middle of the week, do you know how uncomfortable I felt? Because I had no idea where to take my shoes off. I had no idea of anything about it. And just, if you've never went to somewhere that you were out of place, like a different religion, you should walk onto their property, see how uncomfortable you feel and realize that's how people feel who don't know Jesus every time they come here. And so you need to be intentional about helping them, making them feel welcome. And, and I heard a deacon said, listen, folks, we have to be very welcoming because Brian's gonna make them feel very uncomfortable every sermon. I didn't know how to take that. I didn't know if it was a positive thing or negative. I didn't, I didn't know how to do that. And I said, but there's some truth to there. But we don't want people to be turned off because they felt like we're cold and aloof because we're not. So we need greeters to welcome them and love on them. And it's in a simple thing. You just show up a little bit earlier. You high five people. Sometimes you do jump high fives. I don't know, talk to Chuck, he gives hugs. But that's the kind of things greeters do. All right, so we need a bunch of those. We also have office angels. And office angels, the needs are, are, are greater some weeks and smaller some weeks. It, it just depends what's going on. But office angels show up during the week, show up during office time. And they just help out around the office with different tasks because... Scott keeps everybody busy. He's very oppressive as a, as, as a guy to work with. And he just gives everybody so much work. And so sometimes we need volunteers to show up and help us carry out all this stuff Scott wants us to do. Okay, so office angels. Next up, we have worship. Again, once again with Scott, good luck with this, okay? We need singers. If you're a good singer, we want you to join us. If you're not a good singer, Scott's gonna let you know. You can try out anyways, okay? But either way, we'd love for singers to help out if you have a talent to help lead in worship. But here's what's really important. When it comes to singing, 
all of us are singers. Listen, the, you, when I'm sitting there with you singing, our audience is the Lord, right? We are collectively, our, our, our theology is we are collectively a choir singing to God. And so the people up here are helping us lead, They're, they do a good job, but all of us are singers. So you don't have to be on stage to sing. But if you have gifts and talents, abilities to help people sing, let us know. We'd use your help. Also, if you play an instrument. Listen, I don't know if you know this, but Scott likes all instruments. He's a very interesting fellow. He likes all of them. And so all of them. If you play an instrument, he'll find a way to plug it in. I don't know if that's true. Is he texting me right now fussing up? No, he's not. That's not him. Um, But listen, if you play an instrument, if you play the piano, if you play the guitar, if you play the drums, Miles would love a break. I guarantee it. I think he's played for like four years straight. Um, But if you do instruments, you're like, hey, I think those positions are already filled. They're not. We'd love to have a rotation basis. And so if you have these skills, if you play instruments, we'd love for you to come and and help help, help lead the congregation in, in worship. And then we have the tech team. We got a bunch, whether it's camera operators, uh, computer operators, soundboard operators, production, someone looking at it. We got, uh, we need a team of people. There's more we want to do. You know, it's hit or miss with the streaming because of different problems we've been having. And the more people we have, like sometimes there's a problem with technology and we're like, hey, we need the help. And then the two people who deal with the technology the most are usually on stage. So it's really hard to go back there to help with the technology when I'm up here preaching. Or it's hard for Scott to go back there and deal with technology when he's up here singing. And so if you're really good with technology, like, man, I know everything about everything, Brian. I got this covered. Well, good. Let Scott know. We'd love for you to help us with that. We also need uh, adult Sunday school uh, teachers. We need more. We, some classes are too big. Some classes have gotten way too big. And some classes we just need to separate because they've been together way too long and they need to break up to welcome more people. I'm not gonna break any classes up. I'm just telling you it needs to happen. I'm not gonna do it, but it needs to happen. But we need more people for Sunday school to step up and be like, hey, I don't mind leading a group. We have Sunday school going on now, but come in, um, in the fall, we're gonna have small groups on Wednesday nights. And so if you're interested in being a small group leader, you're like, hey, I'd love to be a small group leader. Great, I'm glad we're on the same page. Let us know so you can plug into that. Um, we also have our senior adult ministries. This is what goes on during, um, once a month they have luncheons, they go out to eat. There's just a bunch of different st- stuff uh, when it comes to senior adults. We have a great team of people who are part of that. But here's what I wanna say about the senior adults. What I've said for several years now is we should have one of the most active and alive senior adult ministries in the country. You're like, Brian, how can you say something like that? Because we live in one of the largest retirement communities, one that is continually growing and growing and growing. Go to Conway Rec in the middle of the day, watch how many people play pickleball. I mean, there's just a ton of people who want to be active and do things. We should have an amazing, great senior adult ministry, but you got to have people who who are actively a part of it. You're like, well, Brian, I'm not a senior adult. Listen, I don't wanna have this conversation with you. Some of you are, it's okay. Get involved. Senior adult ministry doesn't mean, you know, that you're not doing anything. We can have active, have pickleball courts. I don't care. I'm trying to think of where we could put them now. Don't worry, next week I'll have where we're putting pickleball courts if that's what we need. But in all seriousness, Looking at the sanctuary. We could figure it out in the sanctuary pretty easy, couldn't we? That'd be interesting. Sorry, I'm brainstorming. But listen, we should have an active senior adult ministry. And it doesn't mean that we can do so much more. There are so many people moving to this area. And we want the senior adults to have the same kind of space like the students do. Fun, fellowship, food, but faith. There are plenty of people moving here from up north who don't know Jesus. Plenty. And we should be a church that has this great ministry who's investing in their lives. And so that's what we want to do. And there's so many other things to be clear, but these are the things we need people to sign up for, to get involved and say, hey, I want to be a part of these ministries. And when it comes to this, like I say, we have people who approach me all the time. They're like, Brian, I got a great idea for ministry at church. I'm like, hey, you're right. That sounds like a great idea. Amazing idea. One of the best I've ever heard for my life. But until we get fully staffed, the things that we have now, we just can't start more. Because our church agreed, I don't know if you remember this, at our business meeting, our church collectively, that's why I love how we do things, our church agreed to this ministry plan. These are the things we're focusing on for 2024. 
And the whole goal is we have that three-year vision we've been over before. That's what we want to accomplish. And the way we're going to accomplish it is by breaking it into chunks. And this is 2024. Some of these things are going to take a little bit longer in 2024. It's not my fault. I want to do everything yesterday. But it's just the way things, way things work. And so we're going to laser like focused on these things. And when it comes, especially the next generation, not just because, and this is important, not just because I have kids, but because I was a messed up kid who desperately needed a church to love on me. It's very important to me because of how I grew up. I went to church plenty. I didn't like them and they didn't like me. And I wish that I could have found some commonality there. It could have stopped me from my biggest regrets in life by just having a group of faith-filled friends because I didn't. So this has nothing to do with my kids. My kids are gonna be fine. I'm gonna love on them. We're gonna make sure they know Jesus, but we need all kids, no matter where they're at, to come in and feel welcomed and have a place to grow and find faith and hopefully not make the same mistakes that at least I made. That's why next generation is so important for me. And very soon, we're going to be moving to two services. We've talked about this before, that way to create more space. So if you volunteer at the nine o'clock hour, then you can go to the service at the next one. Or if you volunteer at one, you can go to the other. And then we're going to have small groups midweek. We know we need to create this because people just, they, they don't want to miss my amazing preaching. I don't know. I guess that's what it is. But like, we just, we just don't want to miss it. I get it. But we're going to be doing that soon. But I ask everybody to just commit to a personal ministry. Something that you are personally saying, this is how I am personally following Jesus's command, not suggestion, not nice to have, but Jesus's command to make disciples. We don't need more committees. We need more people changing diapers, wiping noses, jumping around, singing songs and playing kickball with kids. Like that's what we need. And I ask for you, to get involved because remember, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we're almost done, but I wanna remind you of this, those of you who came to that business meeting we did at the end of the year when we voted on our strategic plan, I wanna remind you something, there are, are 119,666 people within a 20 minute drive of this church. We know this. There are 32.3% which is 38,600, next slide, 652 people who do not believe in God within 20 minutes of this church. There are 51% of that number, 51%. So there are 66,415,000 people who believe that faith is irrelevant to their life. I don't know what kind of life they have. I don't, I don't know how to go through this life without Jesus, folks. There are 38 0.8% of our population, which is 46,430 people find the church boring and uninteresting. These are actual human beings. 55.8% find that is 66,774 people believe religious people are too judgmental rather than the compassion that Jesus clearly was. And then we have 53.4%, which is 63,000 63,902 people don't trust churches. What I'm telling you is the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You see, the mission field is no longer over there in China. It's no longer over there in South America. It's no longer over there somewhere out there. The mission field is here in Conway, the city of Conway, the mission field. This is where the gospel is needed. There are thousands, tens of thousands of people who don't know Jesus here. We don't have to go anywhere. They're all moving here. You've seen the traffic. They're all here. The church is no longer like the center place of society. The church is now a mission field to go and reach out. This is our launching. This is our hub to get refreshed, to launch out into this world, to reach more people. And this is why all those numbers, this is why our very first part of our vision statement says this, our vision has become a welcoming and authentic community of faith where individuals are equipped to pursue Jesus and his purpose for his life. Like that's where we're going. We wanna help people know Jesus. We wanna help people to find their place. And I'm asking you, each one of you, 
to sign up for a personal ministry, to get involved in disciple making, say, hey, this is how I'm helping other people in their faith. And I promise you, money back guarantee, you won't regret it. You won't regret investing in the lives of other people because at the end of your life, you're gonna remember people. You're gonna remember the differences and they're gonna remember you because people are the point. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you know all week we've been asking you to send workers into your field. And we know that there are so many opportunity and so many different needs we have as a church to, to make disciples, to get involved with others. And we just ask you for clarity. We ask you to give us clarity on how we can step up and step out on faith. And Lord, we know it it's, can be daunting. We know it can be challenging. We know we can feel inadequate. But we know these are the lies of the enemy. Because those you call, you equip. And you've equipped us all and asked us all to step up and make disciples. So, Lord, we're ready. We know the harvest is plentiful. And, Lord, we ask you to send us more workers today. We thank you so much for Jesus and the grace that he's given us. We thank you so much for your love and your compassion that you saw us when we were broken and in our sin. You saw us and showed us mercy and grace. We're forever grateful, eternally grateful for you. So, Lord, we ask you, we ask you to give us clarity as we start volunteering and signing up today. So we love you and thank you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray.